This is Dimorphos. Uh, it's an asteroid, and it's a twin. That's it's a Greek name for twin. I don't know the, where the name comes from, but uh, it's a, a binary asteroid system, uh, and NASA crashed a spacecraft into it. And this is the DART mission. And so what? I don't really want to talk about the DART mission because I don't know all the details, but I do know how to model stuff in Python. So let's model the DART collision with Dimorphos unless it's pronounced something different, then don't do that. Okay, where am I? So this is, here we have, this is a twin system. This is Didymos and Dimorphos. Uh, so Didymos is the bigger one, and Dimorphos. And these were taken from the DART impactor before it collided, so they're really nice images. Uh, and then the, some people, I saw some people calling it the Diddy Moon because it's the moon of the asteroid Didymos, which I actually like Diddy Moon better than Dimorphos, but um, there you have it. And this is an image of the a drawing, an, an illustration of the DART spacecraft uh, that collided with uh, Dimorphos. Why would you do this? Well, the whole point was to see what kind of collision you could get with an asteroid uh, and what kind of changes in momentum you could get with that asteroid in the event that we need to t try to divert an asteroid from hitting the Earth. Uh, so the, the reason that you do it with a binary asteroid system is that you can look at its change in orbit because uh, it's not going to be a huge difference uh, from the collision. So that's that. Right, this is a, a video of a not not in real time, of the collision. And I kind of like it because uh, this these are images taken from the impactor uh, every, I can't remember how many seconds before it collides. And you can see a really nice image of uh, Dimorphos right before it collides. And there you go. Uh, this Everyone pointed this out. I want to point this out too. Uh, this is, you know, it take an image, it would upload the image to Earth or send it to Earth. And so it sent this much of the image and then it crashed. So that's kind of cool. Okay, so let's start with the facts, and these are these could be wrong, but I don't I don't I'm, they're close enough that I don't mind. I'm really worried about the physics, not the actual data. So here I have the mass of the impact spacecraft is 570 kilograms, impact velocity of six kilometers per second. Yes, it's very fast, and that's the relative impact speed. Uh, the Didymos mass is. Yeah, Didymos. That's right, Didymos. Uh, it's 5.24 times 10 11 kilograms with a radius of 390 meters. Th those are not spherical asteroids, but I'm just going to pretend like they are. Uh, dimorphous mass is 4.52 times 10 the ninth. Uh, so you know, one of the ways they they calculate these masses, they know the mass of the whole system, and then they look at the relative sizes to kind of say, well, if they have the same density, then you can calculate their masses. And so these are really just approximations. Oh, that radius is 160, not 16. 160. But I use 160 later, so I don't really mind. Uh, the orbital distance between the two is 1.18 kilometers and an orbital period of 11.9 whatever hours. So that's how long it takes for one orbit. And that's the key, right? Because if you know the orbital period before the collision, and you measure the orbital period after the collision, then you can see what kind of effect it had. Instead of having to look at the actual motion of the Diddy moon. Now, here's the other thing. We're going to assume that these uh, asteroids are in a circular orbit. And I think that's a fairly good approximation, uh, although they won't be after the collision, but still pretty close. Okay. So let's use start with a very simple binary model to model. The, I want to model the motion of these two asteroids before I collide it. So here are the two moons. Uh, I'm going to call one mass A and the other one mass B just to keep them. I don't. You can't write mass MD for Didymos and MD for Dimorphos because they're. You know why. Uh, so the orbital radius between the two of them I'm going to call R0. Uh, the vector, I do need the vector from one to the other. And that's important because if you want to model the motion of these things, uh, you need that vector location because you're going to need to calculate the vector force, right, which depends on the vector position relative to the two. So this is your standard gravitational model. The gravitational force is negative g. The product of their mass is divided by the mass, the distance between them squared. And then there's that r hat term in there. That r hat is a unit vector along with the negative sign gives you a vector direction for this gravitational force. And you cannot model the motion of that if you don't put that in there. 
you have to have a vector force. And there's a gravitational constant g. Uh, that's all cool. And then so this is going to be moving with some velocity v. We're going to give it an initial velocity in a circular orbit. Then that velocity would be 2 pi r over t. Now in this model, uh, I'm, I'm starting off, I'll show you, I'm starting off uh, assuming that, well, not really assuming, but I won't actually get the correct period, I don't think, okay, because I'm assuming the center mass is at the center of uh, the larger asteroid. And then I know the, uh, the period, t, and I know r, then I know the initial velocity, so I can calculate that and I get that value. I carried it out really far just because, you know, they're very far, so. So this is the actual Python code, and I will link the code down below, and I will actually show you the code for this uh, at the end. Uh, but let me go over some of the key points here. Uh, so I have my constants here, my uh, orbital distance, and then the nice thing about I'm using uh, GlowScript WebV Python, and you have these three-dimensional objects. So I can make three-dimensional objects super easy in a super easy fashion. So if I just make these two moons and use the type of a sphere, the object of a sphere, I can give it a position, a radius, I can turn on a trail. You could give it different textures, you could give it different colors, you could change the lighting. I'm not doing that, I'm just doing simple spheres. And then I can give them both a mass. Uh, this keep equals sphere, that's just so I can, it's a, it's a tiny little dot far away. Uh, it has a radius of one meter, you can't even see it. But it makes makes it so the the screen doesn't zoom in and zoom out, and that's just and you can there's other ways to set the the way it looks, but I like this way. There's my period. That's 11.92164 hours. I need it in seconds, so multiply by 60 times 60. I calculate my initial velocity. Now I give them both an initial momentum, and here's the trick, right? So Dimorphus has a momentum in the y direction with v zero. In order to make sure that the whole system stays there. I give uh, Didymos a momentum in the neg negative direction. So those two, the total momentum of the two is zero. If you didn't do that, it would it would slowly move up as it orbits. Um, and so I did that. And then uh, time is zero, dt is zero. Um, I guess I should have shown, I think I got this out of order. But uh, so what I'm gonna do is break this into small time steps. And I did get this out of order. Why did I get that out of order? Um, and let me see, let's jump. Who, who cares, right? Let's just jump. Let's see, so there's that. Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain this numerical model uh, when I get to the collision. Um, but I do need a time, I need to break this into small time intervals, and two seconds is a small time interval when you're talking about an 11 hour orbit. And then here's the main loop of the body. I'll get into how this works, uh, but this is a loop for 12 hours. I want to go more than one, one thing. This rate 5,000 tells me how many calculations to do per second. I don't want it to run in real time because I don't want to wait 11 hours for this thing to run. Uh, I calculate that vector R that I talked about. I calculate the gravitational force, and then I update momentum and position of both of the asteroids to get the following motion. So here, this is vPython code. I'm gonna show you how it works. So here's, uh, Didymos and Dimorphos, and this is an orbit. And you can notice, if you look really closely, that this moon actually does move because I'm calculating both, there's a gravitational force on both of them. So uh, Didymos pulls on Dimorphos, but by Dimorphos pulls on Didymos too, so they both orbit a common center of mass. And so we can adjust this to make the period better, uh, the initial velocity better, to take into account that, that uh, Didymos is not stationary. If you didn't do that, it'd be fine. But I just wanted to do it. I have a whole video on uh, calculating binary orbits for stars. Uh, but the main idea is that if I have two uh, asteroids or stars or whatever, and they're orbiting uh, a common center of mass, they're both going to move in circular orbits. They're both going to have the same period, but they're not going to. They're not going to have the same radius of orbit, right? So the lower mass one's gonna have a much larger radius of orbit. The more massive one will have a smaller radius of uh, radial orbit. And I'm gonna skip all the steps, but let's just say the total mass is the sum of the two masses. Then I can calculate the, the orbital radius for uh, MA. I, I'm calling them A and B here, even though in this picture, because I stole it and I didn't want to redraw it. 
uh, has one and two. Uh, it's just the ratio of masses to, from the center mass, that's all. And then the uh, other mass is just the leftover distance, because I know that r is zero distance. I know that, right? So now I'm going to use the ratio of masses to find out how far each one is from the center of orbit. And then I can use the velocity now depends on that radius of its orbit, not the total radius. It's not r0, it's rb, the distance from its orbit. So that gives me a slightly different velocity uh, than if I just assume that the ro is the same as the for the period of oscillation. Okay, so if you do that, here's what it looked like. What I did was I increased the mass of dimorphous by a factor of 10, just so you could see what it would look like. Uh, and you can see the, the wobble more. The, the point of orbit is still inside uh, Didymos. And, and it looks like it's not a circular orbit, but it is. This is a circular orbit about some point right here, but this is also circular or circularly orbiting about a point also. Okay, so I, you have a nice binary asteroid model in Python. And again, the code's down below, and I'm going to show it to you at the end too. Okay, so how do we model the collision? So imagine I want to crash that, that spacecraft into Dimorphos. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, and I, I left that code up there because I was writing something else. What I'm going to do is to use a spring, okay? Uh, I'm going to create an elastic collision. And so the idea is that here's this uh, spacecraft coming towards this asteroid. This has a radius of RB, and then this has a vector position from the center of the asteroid to the spacecraft of RBD, so mass B to DART. And then DART's going to be moving with some velocity vector VD1. Uh, and then I can calculate, as this moves closer and closer and closer, I can recalculate this vector position right here as RDB. It's just the position of the DART minus position of this, this uh, asteroid. Neither of those are at the origin, so I have to do that. At some point, uh, this will actually become closer to the center of uh, di dimorphous than its actual, the radius of dimorphous, Rb. And in that case, when that happens, I want there to be some backwards pushing spring force. But if there's a backwards pushing spring force on the spacecraft, then the spacecraft also has a forward pushing space uh, force on the asteroid. So there's a force between those two, and I'm going to model that as a spring force, and so this would look like. So the spring force uh, has some uh, spring constant k, and this is not a real spring. I'm just making it up, but it, it worked just fine. And it depends on how much that spacecraft is uh, inside the radius of the asteroid. I didn't take into account the radius of the, um, the spacecraft. I just said it, it has no dimensions, just for fun. Um, and then I multiply it by an r hat, so I do make that a vector. And that's important for later, okay? It is a vector, vector force. So what I'm going to do is to say, if those two overlap, there's a spring force pushing them apart. If they don't overlap, then there is no spring force, okay? Uh, and so then I'm just going to pick a spring constant. I think I even change this later, but you're probably going to need something very large. I have a six kilometer per second a spacecraft coming in with a 570 mass, kilogram mass. I mean, it's going to take a lot to stop that thing, but that's the model I'm going to do. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about numerical models. How do we do that? How do we model the motion of uh, an asteroid orbiting another asteroid and then the spacecraft colliding with it. It's all about breaking into small time steps. So except for the collision, the collision is going to be a much smaller time step. I'm going to use uh, time steps of two seconds. I'm going to check every second and see if every time interval, if there is an overlap between DART and dimorphous. If there is, then I'm going to calculate a spring force. And if there's not, then the spring force is zero. But otherwise, I'm going to calculate the gravitational force on Dimorphos, the gravitational force on Didymos. I didn't calculate the gravitational force on DART because it's moving so fast, those masses are so small, it doesn't even really change. You could easily add it into the model. It's not a big deal. After I calculate those forces, if I have the net force on each object, I can use that to update the momentum. So in this equation, P1 is the momentum of an of a the momentum at the beginning of a time interval for one of the objects, whichever one you want, and P2 is the end. It's just at the end of the time interval. You just take the, 
the force acting on that object times the time interval and then add it to the old momentum and you can do that. So just to be clear, uh, Didymos will only have one force acting on it and that's the gravitational force from Dimorphos. The spacecraft will only have one force and that's the spring force due to the collision. And then uh, Dimorphos will have two, the gravitational force due to, to Didymos plus the collision whenever that happens. Once I know the momentum, I can use that to update position of each one. So I can assume the, uh, the position, the momentum's constant during that time interval, which is not true, but it's good enough, and use that to find the new position for every object. And then I just keep doing this over and over and over again. So this is the whole idea of a numerical calculation. So let's start with the, the motion of the spacecraft before it hits the moon, I mean the asteroid. So here I have, this is a small time interval of 0.01 seconds. I start with the spacecraft up here. This is actually starting, uh, already moving, but it's moving at like centimeters per second versus kilometers per second. So you won't see this uh, noticeably move as this thing goes down. So let's, so there it goes. And I just stopped it there. I just ran it to see if it'll collide and it did. And so, so it's not a perfectly head on collision because technically that moon moved just a tiny little bit but it's good enough. I don't want to go into make it more complicated. Uh, so this is just move, uh, moving the uh, position of dart uh, and checking the distance between them to see if it's less than the radius of the of dimorphous. And so I just did it until it was less than that and it stopped. And now I'm going to add in code for a collision. Yeah, six kilometers fastest. So if you just did a two second a time interval, then th the this point appears less than six kilometers away. And what would actually happen is Dart would come down here, way down here. It it would it would never collide. It would it's just jumping right. It would jump right over that that moon and or asteroid. It would never collide. Okay, so here's the collision. And and I did change the time rate. I did change the uh, display rate. Uh, so you can see that it does bounce off, but they're not in the same time scales. Um, and here is all the important code. So this is just, I know there's a collision, okay? Uh, so I'm just going to run it for an extra second. This is an extra second starting from the beginning of the collision until after the collision. Uh, so I calculate the distance, the vector between the two, these two. Uh, and then if it's less than that radius of the asteroid, then I calculate the spring force. But you'll notice up here in 60, Every time I go through this loop, I set the spring force to zero. And so what that does is that it will be zero unless I calculate it another way. And that will, because if you don't have it go to zero, it will collide and it will just stick together and they'll oscillate together. You want to let it get away. Okay, here in line 16, and then here I calculate the gravitational force on dimorphous. Uh, I don't, I'm going to use the same force in the opposite direction for Didymos. Then I update the momentums, I update a momentum of all three objects, I update the position of all three objects, and that's it. So let's look at uh, the momentum of Dimorphos and Dart before and after the collision. So if you, if you plot that, here's what you get. So Dart has an, this is just the Y momentum in that direction. So Dart starts off moving in the negative Y direction, there's a collision and it increases the momentum, and then it's actually moving in the positive Y direction. Uh, Diddy Moon, that's Dimorphos, it's not Diddy, uh, is moving in, it's moving up, it was, right? So it has a much larger momentum, uh, but then it slows down just a little bit. And you'll notice, I'm holding my, my fingers up to the screen, the uh, change momentum for this is the same as the change momentum for that, okay? Because it's the same collision. Okay, let's see how it changes the orbital motion of this, the, the, uh, the moon. So what I did here is I actually have two sets of moons, asteroids. I have two dimorphoses and two uh, Didy, Didymos. And so one of them, the I think it's the white one. I can't remember which one's which. One of them, uh, they're right on top of each other right now, but one of them has no collision and one does have a collision. So we can watch what happens uh, to the motion of these two after the collision just as a comparison. So let's run this. So there's my collision. Uh, there's my two uh, asteroids. They're slightly no longer in the same uh, thing. So the yellow one is the one that had the collision. Okay, And you'll notice it ends up a little behind that one. Also, this orbital 
uh, distance is not the same. It's not actually a circular orbit anymore. If I want, I can plot. Well, it's hard to plot to calculate period just looking at angles and stuff It's because it's kind of hard. What I like to do is actually plot the x position. So this is a x position as a function of time for both of those. So the blue has no impact, uh, has is with the impact and the red is without. And you can see that these two, they do have different periods. They get back to this position a little bit differently. So it did change the period of motion for that. Um, but you know, the great thing about this Python code, especially with that spring force, is that if I just take Dart, this is the same thing, but now Dart has been shifted over a little bit to, your, to the other side. So it's not directly in line. So when it hits, it's going to hit over here, let's say. So the spring force is going to push it this way. So it's going to be like glancing collision. It's easy to do, right? Boom, glancing collision. And I did stop Dart. It just runs off and, and messes up the whole thing. And you see that you do get a difference in uh, orbit. It's not as great as before, so that's that. Okay, I'm going to give you some homework. Uh, what about an inelastic collision? So in an inelastic collision, it's a little bit more difficult to model. Uh, I, I have a video. I'll link it down below uh, to show you how to do that. What about a partially elastic? This one's even harder. Imagine two things that collide together. It's not elastic and they don't stick together. Okay. Again, you can model that. And the basic idea is you have a spring constant for the collision when they're getting closer together and a different a lower spring constant to push them apart. And momentum will be conserved, but uh, kinetic energy will not be conserved. Uh, and this is really what happens with the actual collision is that it ejects debris. Um, and that debris acts because the spacecraft's not going to rebound. A non-planar collision, everything I did was in the XY plane. Uh, you can have it come in at an angle like that and see what happens. It's just for fun. Okay. Uh, change the impact parameter. I did that, right? The impact parameter is the distance between a line uh, so it hits straight on or if you shift it off to the side. And you can see what happens. What if you just take... I'm just thinking off the top of my head here. Take an asteroid orbiting the sun and collide dart. So it's not a double asteroid. Could you measure, could you actually measure the change in, in period for that case? I think it'd be kind of hard, but it would, it would, it would have an impact. That's a joke. Um, I had profit. I was trying to be funny. Okay. Let me go and show you uh, the actual code. Now this code warning, um, I messed around with a whole bunch of stuff, but I just want to show you a bunch of things in here. Uh, and I'm going to link this code down below so you can uh, play with it. So the first thing is I have these graphs up here um, and I change all my graphs a bunch of times. I had two different graphs, one for the momentum of, you can't have the momentum of both objects in the same graph because they have such hugely different momentums. Uh, here's all my constants and stuff. I showed you all that. Here I have Diddy, Dymo, Diddy2, and Dymo2. And Diddy2, Dymo2 are the non-impact versions. They're my reference uh, asteroids. And then I have them all give them masses. The, there's Dart, there's my velocity, there's my momentum. Spring constant right there, that's something you could change. I told you about keep. There's my period, my initial velocity, momentums. That's all my initial conditions. So the first thing I do is this loop right here, this just uh, models the motion until it hits. And then, so, but I update the momentum of everything. The only force acting on it is this gravitational force. I have two gravitational forces. Bec I can't use the same force. I could here, actually. But uh, Diddy 2 and uh, Diddy not 2 will be in different positions. So they're going to have different forces. I have to recalculate both of those. So I have an R for the collision and an R2 for the non-collision. This time right here is the collision. Notice that my time interval, my time step is 0 0.001, so it's much smaller. And you need to do that because uh, the motion, the forces get really big, and you want to be able to really change that momentum. Um, then I did change the color just because I was having trouble shooting something, and I figured out what my error was, but I talked about that stuff. Um, and then here, this is just after the collision. Uh, you don't have to worry about the spring force because they're, they're definitely not. I, I picked some time interval during the collision to model. What I wanted to do is change back to this frame rate of the calculation step of two seconds. You can't do that whole loop 
for 11 hours at 0 0.001. Uh, and then that's that. Um, and that's just to calculate the period. I did that later. Uh, well, that's one way to calculate the period is to see when is it, when does it get back to the same x position, and then you could you could tell that time. And I didn't print that out, but but that's that. Whoa. Okay. There you go. Hopefully I get you started on some good homework questions. Hope you enjoy that. I'll put some links down below for the relevant stuff. If I forget something you needed, just let me know. I'll be happy to reply and add stuff to that description down below. Okay. I'll talk to you later.